There is a very powerful, uh, you know, a, a extraordinarily powerful part of the entire sort of capitalist ideology is making you worry only about yourself, lose any connection to other people, destroy solidarity, just leave solidarity in the hands of the investing class. The rest of you just worry about yourself. Uh, this goes way back. You read the working class press uh, in 1850 uh, in around the places like where I live, you know, which was in around New England, which was the center of the early Industrial Revolution. There was a very lively working class press run by mechanics and you know, what they called factory girls, uh, young women off the farms and so on. A very interesting reading, but one of the things that they were denouncing was exactly this tendency, the, what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self, you know, which they regarded as degrading and demeaning and destroying you know, their human values and so on, uh, correctly. In fact, the labor movement throughout its whole history has been fighting against this. Work together, because you know, we're all in it together and we want to help each other. Uh, that's a very different ethic. That's just a traditional ethic. It took modern capitalism to even question it. Uh, but, and I think that what questions it is very anti-human. Well, that shows up in connection with the schools. It comes down to the question, do I care whether the kids down the street get an education? Well, I think we should. You know, I think we should care that uh, it's a... Uh, but, but notice, that means, that means public education. In fact, I think that's the major motive for public education, it's like public health. You know, it's like a public health system. Do we? Do I care that the kids down the street have sewage? Uh, okay. Well, same question. You know, I mean, why not just me? I should have sewage, and they, they should have a you know, uh, uh, like a you know, a hole in the out in the backyard. Well, you know, that's a question of what kind of a world you want to live in. Do you want to live in a world where people care for each other, care about each other? Yeah, I think we, I, at least I think we ought to live for that kind of a world. But then that some form of community education, whatever you call it, is part of that. It means that children ought to have the best opportunities they can have and the best uh, chance for developing their own powers that they can get, whether they're my kids or somebody else's kids. And the whole move towards vouchers and privatization and so on is, in effort, is uh, as far as I can see, like uh, trying to privatize health care, which says, well, who cares if they're healthy down there as long as I'm rich enough to buy health care for myself? That's a very dangerous tendency. So are you saying you support public education? Do I support it? It's good as it, I think it's good as it, it's socialized, but it's the same as with, with Medicare. It's like you're given their choice. Like, Who's choice? You have to like go to this school and learn these things. You know, well, that's different. Yeah, let's see, but that's, look, I mean, you could ask the same about Medicare. I mean, it, you, should, you should be able to make a choice. A, like what kind of a choice? In Each individual, yeah. Should, so a, a community system or a public system should have plenty of choices. Like, I send my daughter to an alternative school, and I have to pay $200 a month yeah. because, the, because it doesn't get funded, and I think I should be able to choose what kind of school I send her to. Yeah. And it's the same, but it's the same with health care. I can get health care covered if I go to a medical doctor, but if I go to a naturopathic doctor, the visit gets covered, yeah. but my so there is or anything. So it's like, okay, well, we have this socialized education and socialized health care, but only if we pick what we want. But that's what a democratic, a democratic society and a free society of cooperating people ought to allow options. If, if you're only given the choice of everybody's kids go to a factory called a school or else I make choices for them, well, that's not a very good set of choices. Uh, but I think we ought to be working for a public education system that, uh, you know, that, that really does provide uh, opportunities and options and freedom and so on, up to some limit. I mean, you know, you can't, up the, and the limit has to be determined by a community. Incidentally, uh, one of my kids I ended up sending to a private school too, though I'm not in favor of it. Just because. She doesn't go to a private school, it's like a, a no curriculum child run. Yeah, I, well, one of my daughters actually ended up going to a friend's school.
which is about as close to that as you can get in the Boston area. But that was for, you know, I wasn't happy about it, but uh, for various reasons, given the options within the public school system, we just felt we had to do it. So I'm not saying that these are easy personal choices, given bad options. They're not, and the same is true of health. You know, like, uh, I mean, I know that like if my one of my kids, let's say, really needed expensive health care and you couldn't get it through the public system, I'd find a way to pay for it myself. Though I don't think there ought to be that ought to happen. Well, it's because we're given a set of bad choices. Uh, so within the set of bad choices, I think the thing to do is try to make them better, not eliminate the good things, because uh, some aspects of the good things aren't working. I mean, in a way, it's like uh, you know, anything you point to is going to be like that. Uh, every institution that exists is distorted by concentration of power and many other things are uh, fine so you try to overcome those distorting effects but you don't throw away whatever is useful about institution you say something about the labor movement I mean, the labor movement I, I think has been over oh, over the years has been a major force in democratization and improving people's lives and so on and so forth on the other hand it's crooked as hell you know all involved with gangsters and so on and so forth well, okay, you know, so you, instead of saying, okay, let's throw out the labor movement, what you say is let's get rid of that aspect of it. Make it more responsive to workers. There's been a lot of... Yeah, okay, let's, let's, yeah, and I, I, wait a minute, let's, but I think, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's better to keep to the mics. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut off the previous speaker. I, I have a question. There's been a lot of discussion um, lately about the fact that corporate profits have been rising while well, at the same time, layoffs of, of employees have been going up as well. And recently, the Secretary of Labor in the U.S. and the Minister of Industry in Canada have both uh, made, well, fairly tepid, tepid comments about um, the, um, uh, the conduct of uh, corporations laying off workers when their, their profits are, are skyrocketing. And I just want to hear your comments on that. Well, first of all, layoffs is the least of it. I mean, for about 20 years now, uh, um, non, uh, uh, wages, wages in the United States, again, I only know the detailed figures for the United States and Europe. I don't know them for Canada. But in uh, uh, the United States, at least, let me talk about that. I don't think it's much different here. Around the early 70s, wages started to stag, real, real income started to stagnate. Uh, and by around 1980, it started to decline. Uh, so um, if you take the median wage, you know, half below, half above, uh, it's been declining fairly steadily since around 1980. That continued right through the uh, Clinton recovery. The Clinton years, the recovery was, in fact, the growth was faster than during the Reagan years, but it was unprecedented in that wages kept going down. So I think something like, if I remember, 95% or so of uh, families, some very high number, uh, lost family income from 89, 1989 when the recession started through 1993, which is after the recovery and it's the last year for which we have figures, and it's probably still going down. Uh, for uh, what they call unskilled workers, which means like 70 to 75 percent of the workforce, uh, um, they've lost about 20 percent or so of uh, income since about 1980. That's the core of this, you know, angry white male phenomena and so on, what Buchanan's appealing to. Uh, for college graduates, wages started going down around 1987 after the full effect of the Reaganite social changes hit, and they're still going down. Uh, so there's so layoffs is one aspect of it, but the other aspect is just a general collapse, a general attack on working people across a very broad spectrum. And at the same time, co corporate profits are just un, you know breaking all records. And if you read Fortune and Business Week and so on, they can't even find the adjectives anymore to describe how <laughs> stupendous and dazzling and so on it is. Uh, last year, uh, Fortune has every Fortune magazine, you know, the big business magazine, every like May uh, has a, an issue devoted to the Fortune 500, the top 500 corporations. And last, the one last May was really pretty, uh, 
pretty impressive. I mean, they couldn't get over how fantastic it was. Fourth straight year of double-digit profit growth, you know, 54% profit growth last year. They expect it to continue after four years of it. Uh, so the country is just flooded with capital. Uh, you know, it's not lean and mean or anything like that. Absolutely flooded with capital, more and more narrowly concentrated, uh, while for most of the populations, either stagnation or decline. Well, layoffs is one aspect of that that happens to be hitting the newspapers now, but it's a pretty small aspect of the whole picture. Well, that's, uh, you know, these are the results of a very definite social policy back starting in the early 70s. Pretty powerful new weapons uh, were placed into the hands of private tyrannies, what we call private business, which are just big totalitarian institutions, uh, basically unaccountable ones, and they got a lot of uh, new weapons to beat people over the head with. Uh, and by one, the main one being the huge explosion of financial markets, uh, which has just been extraordinary in scale. Uh, and that's had an enormous effect. I mean, uh, I mean, I'll give you some of the numbers if you like, they're really mind-boggling. Uh, the effects were already understood by the late 70s pretty well understood that this was going to drive down growth rates, concentrate wealth, lead to a kind of low wage, low growth, high profit equilibrium. But that's only part of it. Uh, the, uh, uh, another aspect of it is that there is now tremendous pressure from invest from financial markets, you know, big money managers, which have, who have huge amounts of capital in their hands and can move it around very fast. Uh, one effect of contemporary telecommunications is you can take, say, the whole New York banking system and put it in Tokyo every, every, every day, you know, so you can use the uh, financial markets over there and make a little more money and then use them over here and make a little more money. I mean, that's why you have, uh, it takes MIT, you know, science engineering school. Uh, there are corporate recruiters who come around every, uh, you know, May, June to try to pick up the smart guys in the science and engineering, the PhDs. Last year, 25% of them were from Wall Street, corporate recruiters. They were going after math and physics PhDs. Uh, these guys don't know anything about Wall Street, but they're smart guys who know how to work out complicated scams uh, that will enable you to get a tiny bit more profit by, you know, some intricate device uh, in speculative markets. Uh, that's having a huge effect on the international economy and the domestic economy. For example, it's forcing, uh, it's forcing corporations to move toward, say, a manager, a guy who's doing the actual, you know, the, the, the guy's in a management position in a corporation, let's say the CEO or the guys on the board of directors. It's forcing them to look for very short-term profit. Because if they don't go for very short-term profit, there's going to be a rapid exit of capital to somewhere else which is getting short-term profit. And that's having a problem. I don't think anybody's worked it out yet, but there's a general assessment that this is having a very harmful effect on the economy altogether. Just as the rapid transfer of uh, the, the uh, enormous growth of capital that's used for speculation against currencies is also having a tremendous effect. It moves towards, uh, it, it attacks any, any, any country, even a big country like the United States that tried to introduce stimulative measures. Capital would flow out of it really fast uh, because uh, this capital does not want growth. What they want is stable currencies and growth can threaten stable currencies. So they want low growth, Stable currencies, you know, no inflation, uh, tremendous profits, and wages going down. And at home, you're getting pressures against, uh, you know, private enterprise never does much long-term planning. But whatever there is, there's pressure against it uh, because you want to make sure that you have uh, high profits the next quarter or else you're going to lose the capital that can move around very fast now. So these things are having big effects. Uh, and they started around the early 70s and have been expanding ever since. And there are others, you know, the global, what they call globalization, you know, the huge, there's been a considerable escalation of transnationals and so on and so forth. And in different ways than in the past, they're doing different things than they used to do. They've always been around. Uh, but uh, yeah, all of these are putting very powerful weapons into the hands of private power, and they're using it uh, to try to uh, unravel the social contract.
that has been established after lots of struggle. Big attack on labor, incidentally, is part of it. So in the United States, uh, as you know, unionization has gone way down, but it isn't, uh, the, a, lot, a large part of that is, I mean, I don't like the term conspiracy, and I don't use it much, but this is real conspiracy. There was a state corporate conspiracy in the 80s, very blatant state corporate conspiracy to destroy unions. Now, corporations have always wanted to destroy unions, but they were, but state power in the 80s essentially authorized it and pretty openly. Uh, the, pl the only place where I've seen really good reviews of this is in the business press, which are very frank about it. Business Week, for example, had very good stories about it. Uh, how uh, the government basically polled the private sector from the early 80s, they're simply not going to enforce the laws. So do what you like, you know. And in fact, the number of um, illegal firings of uh, organizers shot up. I think it went up by like a factor of six or something. Uh, the number of the uh, uh, Corporations were told that OSHA, the uh, Safety and Health, or Office of Safety and Health, uh, something or other, you know, the government office that looks after safety and health standards, uh, would simply not enforce standards. And in fact, the number of days, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the number of working days lost to injury went up by about 50 percent very quickly. Uh, and that's across the board. Uh, illegal firings. Uh, uh, the use of, it has been technically legal in the United States since the late 30s uh, to use uh, permanent replacement workers. The United States may be one of the few industrial countries where this is even on the books, but it's after the Wagner Act was packed in, passed in 1935, which sort of, which for the first time gave workers the right to organize that they had in just about every other industrial country. Supreme Court very quickly undercut it uh, within a few years and technically allowed the right to uh, hire permanent replacement workers, which is much worse than scabs, notice. Uh, but, the, but the balance of forces was such that the major corporations could never do it, they never thought of doing it. Well, by the late 80s, they started thinking of doing it. And uh, the first big manufacturing corporation, big manufacturing corporation to do it was Caterpillar. That uh, was part of a major union-busting strategy in right at the center of the heartland of working class America, Decatur, Illinois, big working class town, uh, three major unions, you know, the biggest unions, uh, and there was a big corporate attack on them, three transnationals, one British, one Japanese, and one uh, Caterpillar US based, and they just wanted to destroy uh, the unions very openly. Uh, they used the huge profits, they, they used their excess capacity overseas, like Caterpillar explained its business strategy, at least in the business press. They said that uh, uh, um, they're going to force they're going to force workers to capitulate because they've used their enormous profits to build excess capacity overseas, like in Brazil and so on, which allows them to fill their international markets even if they don't produce here. Plus permanent replacement workers here, and you know, uh, a lot of huge growth in temporary workers. You know, to, you know, no benefits, all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, these weapons. Uh, this got. I mean, actually, the, the United States was actually censured by the International Labor Organization, which is extremely rare. I mean, they never tap uh, the wrist of their rich funders. Uh, but it got to the point that the U.S. was actually censured by the ILO for using permanent replacement workers, which viol in the Caterpillar case, uh, which violates all international labor standards. And in fact, the U.S. was urged to sort of accept international labor standards, which it doesn't. All right, this was outright conspiracy. I mean, the state federal government simply authorized uh, the use of uh, uh, illegal methods, some of them flatly illegal methods, uh, to, to attack and destroy and undermine unions. Well, they couldn't have gotten away with that earlier. Incidentally, here's another case where the left simply abandoned the terrain. Uh, Decatur workers were going around, the, they, of course they weren't covered in the press. None, you know, obviously you don't expect the corporate media to cover this stuff. But Decatur workers were really fight. they all lost incidentally, they got smashed. You know, they all, it was a total disaster, all three of them. Uh, part, and a big part of the reason for that was that the pop, people who ought to be the left just didn't give a damn. Like in Boston, 
uh, when Staley workers came to try to organize some support, we had a meeting for them, which ought to have been this many people. It's in the room where this many people show up for anything. Uh, there were 75 people. It's the first time I've talked at a, I talk a lot at those meetings on every imaginable topic. This is the first time in about 20 years I've seen the place almost filled. Why? Well, just a bunch of, you know, white males. Uh, who cares about them? Uh, working people from Decatur, Illinois, who are trying to preserve and restore and ultimately rebuild uh, the American labor movement. Okay, those are the kind of guys who are going to be out uh, in the militias pretty soon, or listening to Pat Buchanan, and uh, I think we can partly blame ourselves for that, not insignificantly. But the point is there were powerful weapons, and they're being used all over the world. I mean, the United States and Britain, uh, first they were used to destroy the weaker working classes, like in Latin America. Latin America, you know, Latin America had pretty organized and powerful working classes, but they're much weaker societies. So they were just smashed by structural adjustment and so on. They're by now really devastated throughout the continent. Uh, in the industrial world, it's a tougher nut to crack, uh, and it started with the United States and England. Uh, the United States and England are worst in this respect. That's the Thatcher-Reagan period. It's a big attack on working people, also on families, on children, you know, it's across the board. Uh, and uh, Europe and Japan are not, are still kind of holding on. Canada's sort of in between. I mean, it's somewhere between the United States and, the, and uh, the Anglo American model and the European. Japanese model, but in a more integrated global economy, it's going to be awful hard for anybody to hold out unless there is substantial popular resistance. Because most of the, I mean, what's actually happening is most of the world is being turned into a kind of third world. Uh, you can see it's pretty dramatic in places like the United States and England, less so in continental Europe, but uh, uh, unless there's substantial resistance to this, that's pretty much what's going to happen. Uh, so layoffs is a piece of it, but it's a much bigger p picture. And I don't think that the kind of talk that's coming out of Washington even relates to this issue. I mean, asking corporations to be nicer, you know, I mean, that's like a joke, you know. In fact, there, there was uh, back around, uh, I don't know, like in the Kennedy years, uh, around that period, there was a lot of talk about how corporations had changed. I remember when colleague of mine who was in fact the head of the Institute for Advanced Studies and then was in the Kennedy administration at MIT, who's an economist, wrote a paper called The Soulful Corporation. The idea is that corporations had become soulful. You know, they used to be kind of money grubbing and so on, but now they're and that is just ridiculous. I mean if any corporation here Milton Friedman and those guys are absolutely right. Uh, if a corporation tried to be anything but, you know, really monsters. Uh, they would, it would be basically illegal. They would not be fulfilling their responsibility to their shareholders. And furthermore, they would be eliminated. They'd be cut out of the market because somebody else wouldn't be soulful and would be making more money. This is institutional. You know, it has nothing to do with anybody being nice. Uh, these are institutional facts. And as long as, I mean, it's like trying to ask, uh, uh, you know, uh, some totalitarian state to be more nice to its people. Well, you know, it doesn't make sense. What you do with a totalitarian state is eliminate it. You don't ask it to be nicer to people. Uh, and these are totalitarian systems. Uh, these, uh, a, a corporation is a totalitarian system. And by now, they're very big ones. You know, they're, they're huge command economies, uh, which are internally modeled. Uh, I mean, they're just the you know, they have ex pretty much the structure of a totalitarian state. Uh, they unify the judicial, legislative, and executive functions in a top, unaccountable uh, control system. Uh, the only accountability is to investors, which means other, you know, banks and, uh, you know, big investment firms and so on. Uh, and the public accountability is limited to the regulatory system, which, of course, they're trying to destroy. So it's essentially a takeover of power by big totalitarian institutions, which, incidentally, their roots come, their roots are not very, di are about the same as uh, the other contemporary forms of totalitarianism, Bolshevism and fascism. Uh, they all come out of uh, late 19th century, uh, you know, vaguely Hegelian ideas about uh, organic entities having rights above individuals and so on and so forth. There's actually pretty good scholarly work on on this, on the origin of 
20th century. The corporations got their current power mostly in the early part of the century. You know, they're not like uh, sort of graven in stone. The rights of immortal persons uh, with things like free speech and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's early 20th century. Uh, and it uh, was not granted by legislation either. It was done mostly by courts and lawyers and so on. Uh, and it's a form of totalitarianism, and you don't ask it to be more soulful any more than you ask uh, Stalin to be more soulful. It's, these are institutional structures. They behave the way they do. You have to eliminate them. And so these were truisms in the working class movements not very long ago. Uh, by now, they sound really weird, but that's a sign of the, uh, the, of the victory of powerful uh, uh, propaganda systems, corporate propaganda systems. It's simply driven out of people's heads what used to be everybody's understanding. Uh, in fact, you go back to the early to the, uh, century ago in the AFL, you know, which is not particularly radical. These are the things people were talking about at the national meetings. Yeah, let's get rid of all these things and working people. Working people ought to own the mills and the, and run them. They're, they build them, they work in them, they ought to run them. That was one of the big issues in the Homestead uh, strike back in 1892. You know, uh, well, you know, if it's been beaten out of people's heads, that's our our problem. We ought to get it back in people's heads. It's not very strange. It's sort of natural and automatic, just like opposition to any other form of totalitarianism. Uh, and playing games about them. they should be nicer to people, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, sure, if you can sort of impose by force, if you can use federal, say OSHA, if you can impose health and safety standards on them, fine, that's better than not having those standards, but there should be no illusions. That's like forcing a totalitarian state because of some countervailing force to act nicer. Okay, maybe you can do it, but that's not the answer. Um, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I consider myself to be a Machiavellian. Uh, excuse me. Your use of the word totalitarian is a boo term, and I'm not afraid. It is. Martin, no, that's Martin not a, Kitchen that's not a descriptive term. Uh, Martin Kitchen, who wrote a book on fascism, calls it a boo term. Who? Martin Kitchen up at SFU. He, he wrote a book on fascism. Totalitarianism is a boo term. What you got to do is unpack the usage of the word totalitarianism. Right. Machiavelli. If you look at Machiavellianism as Machiavellianism from above and from below, yeah. Bakunin has been called a Machiavellianism from below. I, I think we're... We need more envious like workers. We don't need sentimentality from Noam Chomsky. Yeah, this is nothing... You're too sentimental about the workers. Oh, the poor okay, little fine. bleeding workers. Yeah, we, I, need, I, we need envy from below and greed from above. We're not going to get anything but greed from above. You have admitted that. But you want sentimentality from below. No, I don't want reason. sentimentality. I want struggle, freedom, justice, well, what's solidarity. What's wrong with envy? And, wrong with that. And, and, uh, and when I, incidentally, when but when you, I used the word totalitarian, I meant it. Uh, it's true I didn't say much about it, but when I was talking about centralizing the legislative, executive, and uh, 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 judicial functions in a top uh, center, I, I was actually quoting. I didn't say so because it wasn't time, but I was quoting from a pretty mainstream uh, politi Veblenite political economist uh, back when I was around 19, the early 1940s, Robert Brady, uh, who wrote a book on business as a system of power uh, in which uh, he described quite well uh, the way in which totalitarian institutions like corporations were developing in the industrial world <clears throat> with many counterparts to the fascist systems. There's more recent work when I mentioned scholarship. I had something in mind too. Um, there's a legal historian at Harvard, very good one, Morton Horowitz, who has two big fat books on the transformation of American law. Uh, and if you look at the second volume, he goes, which is the more, you know, goes through, say, 1860 to 1920 or so, uh, he talks about the origin of modern corporate corporations and corporate law in exactly these terms. This is, these are descriptive terms. They are not boot terms. Okay, why can't we have uh, something like Max Stirner's alliance of egoists from below? Well, you can have it if you want, but that's not the world well, I you want. You want sentimentality and organicism no. of the well, poor and weak. Well, you what, want an organic what you call communism, totalitarianism of the left wing. Okay. Eh? 
I think we've exhausted okay. this topic. <laughs> you want sentimentalism of the left wing, organicism of the left wing. Okay. Excuse me. That's what it sounds like Excuse to you. Uh, okay. He cut me off. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, this left wing has point, I'm told. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, not long ago in this province, uh, some, uh, it, some changes were made in the legislature to, legislation to make sterner uh, penalties for things like distribution of hate literature in response to an increased perception of groups like the Aryan Nation and the, and the um, Heritage Front. And while it's, it's definitely important to preserve uh, free speech, freedom of speech, it is also um, clear that uh, um, the increased activity of such groups also needs to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what thoughts you might have about uh, what means uh, could be done so apart from trying to um, make stricter penalties for distribution of hate literature. Well, I'm against it. I don't think the state should have the power to decide what people think and say. Right. I don't want the state to have that power. Uh, and I think uh, I, I mean, it's, it's bad to have people running around with hate literature, but the way to do it is not to give power to some more dangerous entity like the state. Uh, the, what you have to do is meet them on, you know, get to the people that they're reaching. Right. Uh, they are reaching people who are susceptible to this literature. Why? Well, for reasons of the kind I mentioned. Let's take uh, uh, the, the, the people who have been subjected to the social policies that we all know and which we just alluded to. Yeah, they're going to be frightened, angry. They're going to search for somebody to blame it on. They're going to uh, be easy targets for hate literature, just as they were under the Nazis. Well, the way to deal with that was not to outlaw Mein Kampf. That wouldn't have changed a thing. It was to deal with the sources in the society for what Hitler was appealing to. And the same is true here. Incidentally, if you're worried about talk that harms people, picking out hate literature is a very odd choice. Yes, that harms people, but uh, um, free market ideology harms them way more. Uh, if you take, uh, if you want to know people who are really suffering, you know, let's, uh, 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 who, who's really suffering from the kind of IMF fundamentalism, which is mostly phony, but it's true that it's a dominant ideology, at least among elites. Well, you know, go to, you know, Africa or Latin America or poor slums in the United States, and you'll find people suffering, mostly women, incidentally, and suffering miserably, like mortality rates for uh, women and infants have gone way up. Okay, hate literature hasn't done that. Uh, if you're worried about harming people, there are much more obvious candidates. And the answer to this is not to have the state uh, powerful enough to stop people from talking about this stuff. That's not the answer. I don't think I can say thank you any better than all of you have to know. Uh, thanks very much on behalf of the UPC Federation of Labor and the Vancouver and District Labor Council. And uh, my thanks to all of you for being so patient.